A lot of young people coming up and asking how you get in the business. Hollywood seems to be fascinated with technology and as against where's the story, what's the character. That sort of separates them from that young filmmaker who can't get his film seen by anybody. Yeah, it's a break in the Hollywood thing that's uh, perception has got to be lost. If you're going to be a filmmaker, learn how to write. That's where the courage comes in. Hi, I'm John Jacobson, and today we're in Seattle to talk to the actor Tom Scare. Tom is probably the best known actor in the world whose name you just can't remember, but you've literally seen him in hundreds of films. Robert Altman's MASH, Top Gun, Alien, Steel Magnolias, A River Runs Through It, Contact, and his Emmy Award winning performance in Picket Fences. Tom is a very gifted actor whose career spans 45 years, and he is very dedicated to the city in which he lives, Seattle, and to the art scene here. In fact, in 2004, Tom started the Film School, a boot camp-like experience dedicated to elevating the art of writing and directing in film. Let's see if he's here. Hey, Tom. Hey, Jack. How are you? I'm doing all right. You gonna buy me some coffee? I'm buying. For once, I'm okay, buying. Okay, I'll take you in there and get for nothing. So this is your neighborhood Starbucks, right? This be it. This Howard, Howard and I own this one. That's a nice one to share that with you. Could you give me a decaf soy mocha? I have a uh, short eggnog latte. These guys are doing all right here. Your help. So, thanks Tom, thanks for being here. I thought we'd start with just you talking about how you got started in the business and how that happens. I'm sure a lot of people are interested in how you break in and you've had such a successful career. How did that happen? <laughs> yeah, I've had a lot of young people, of course, coming up and asking how you get in the business as if I knew how. I have no, I haven't a clue how to get in the business. Didn't then, don't now. I think it's worse now than ever before. But this idea of how do you get in the business, all I can do is to tell these young people what my experience was. I went to UCLA ostensibly. I'd been in that, I'd done theater because I wanted to overcome being shy and self-conscious. I didn't think I was going to make a living at it. But I went to film school at UCLA to direct. But I felt if I was going to direct, I needed to continue it to act so I know what that was. And I needed to know what writing was by doing it. So doing all this, learning camera, learning lenses, learning how to edit, I did theater. And I was doing a show in the last semester at UCLA when some guys who were doing a little low-budget feature saw me in this play and wanted me to, to be in this movie. Now, I didn't have an agent, but I was seen in a play. I was seen in performance, which is the point here, is that young people have to be seen in performance. Young people have to know what they're doing when they go out on a stage. Because you don't know who's out there in an audience. It's going to come along and hire you. I didn't, as I said, didn't have an agent. I did this film. Happened this film was with three or four other actors. One was Robert Redford, another was Sidney Pollack. I met some director who lived near UCLA, who saw an assemblage of this film, and we were talking one day, and he said, I saw this, I'm doing this television show, why don't you come over and play this, this part? I still didn't have an agent. So the first, and I have to tell you this story. Can I tell you a little story? Yeah. Can we take the time to tell you this story? First day on this, in this television set, and I'm thinking, wow, Hollywood. 
I'm actually in a Hollywood soundstage. Wow, and I'm looking at this electrician moving back and forth up there, setting lights in the set. And this director friend of mine is sitting next to me, who happened, by the way, to be Robert Altman. <laughs> and I'm looking at this guy who's moving back and forth, setting these lamps, and he's got an empty five-gallon bucket that he's carrying with him, which I figured was germane to the job, right? Otherwise, why carry it? And I'm thinking, well, Hollywood. I said, there's really something in there, Bob. Watch, just watch these guys. Uh, and uh, Just learn by watching, huh? And the guy throws up in the bucket. And, and I'm looking at this, and he leans over and he says, that's Hollywood. Do you believe in luck or do you believe in, because you can't teach someone luck, we can't tell young people have luck and your career will go, what advice do we give them? Get out there as much as you can, isn't it? Be seen as much as you yeah, can. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Luck, you cannot rely on luck at all. Luck comes your way only if you put yourself out there. And it's just putting one foot in front of another. Each day you just got to make yourself better. And if you do that, somehow or another, someone along the way is going to say, hey, he's he or she is, they're working at their craft. You just have to be open to the, to the things that may come. They may not be what you intended. I was gonna, I really, I thought I wanted to be Frank Sinatra. Can you sing? I could then, <laughs> but someone already had the job, so I was painting as an artist. And uh, some writing teacher also said, you should really seriously consider writing. So there were all these riches kind of laid in front of me. And lo and behold, I wound up an actor <laughs> through it all. So I feel very fortunate. But uh, it's not out of being so much lucky as I made luck come my way by really working at everything, all these things to become better at one of them, and one of them would take me away. Uta Hagen, the great acting teacher, said that do everything you can, and if it's not any good, don't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah, I never heard that one. In your long career, you've worked for 45 years in the business. Do you think that story or good writing has diminished over those years? Has it always varied? Are you seeing a decline of story? The answer is it's by and large diminished in film and it's, uh, it's improved in television, in cable television. The writing is, 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 that's great writing. There's some great writing going on in television. The writing for film really has to be more, more than what it is now. Well, that seems to be a lot of what I see in Hollywood and you may comment on that too, is that Hollywood seems to be fascinated with technology and with the, the whiz-bang aspects of what's up on the screen as against story. Would you say that's true or do you see that a lot, this sort of technological fascination, digital, cameras, special effects, as against where's the story, what's the character, who are we trying to empathize with? Well, Spielberg said back in the 70s, and you, yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with this quote. He said he was his concern about the success of his technologically based films was that technology would become more important than storytelling, and storytelling in the future might become diminished, which I think is absolutely what's happened. Well, I think you're right. <clears throat> what's that great quote that film is the literature of our time? And so there seems to be some kind of obligation on filmmakers to do what? To educate? I don't know. I don't think people go to the films to, to be educated. But Well, we owe that to them, though. We, as the creatives, have to know that we have to give them some substance, some reality, something. I like to say it's we have the obligation to give the audience uh, two hours in the dark of a theater with their time, but something to take home. But it takes a lot of work to get there. And we have, if we're gonna be in this business, we gotta work at it. We can't just go in there and hope to be a movie star. A movie star is not the point. 
We have to back away from that kind of thinking because that's superficial and what we have to do is think about the responsibility we have to elevate and even educate to some extent. It sort of reminds me of that quote by uh, Chomsky, this manufactured consent, that if you just keep feeding the same product to people, they'll eventually believe that's the best product because they have nothing else to compare it to. So you just keep feeding that Hollywood fodder or just bad movie fodder, they believe that's good filmmaking. Nothing else to compare it to, yeah. As I sit here and I listen to you, you know, you, we've known each other for several years and I'm still always learning from you and I can just feel the whole room, the crew and everybody just learning about from that wealth of knowledge you have of experience. So it really is true. So I'm really grateful for that. And I have more questions though about... <laughs> Not at all! Tom, it's so fascinating to hear about what you've been doing and I think anybody wants to hear about how someone like you with so much experience has broken in and, and what you love to do. And, so now maybe we can start talking about what you're going to do next or what you're working on or where your passions are. Passion and what I have to do next is go home to my passion, which is my baby and my lady. So can we take a walk home? You want to come home? With I'd love that. All That'd right, be great. Let's go. Okay, well, I've got two of them. <laughs> so you're up, you're up, up this way? <laughs> yeah, down here. And you've lived down here how long? Ten years. Yeah. <laughs> Pixar has those huge budgets. You know, and so it's not like they're a small little film made by a bright young filmmaker. Part of the problem is that Pixar can spend that time on development, as all filmmakers should, I think. But Pixar then can roll it out, and they can also get Tom Hanks to do the voiceover, and they can bring those kind of names in, or you, or whatever. And that sort of separates them from that young filmmaker who can't get his film seen by anybody. The point is, though, it's, it's the most influential of media. We have a responsibility. I keep saying this over and over again. We have a responsibility to at least tend to the writing, at least tend to it more, give more focus on, on writing, give more credit to the writer for, uh, none of us can do anything if we don't have good writing. If we don't have writing. Right, I mean, I always like to say, you, you can put a camera in the room and shoot with one camera angle. If the story is brilliant, it'll carry the movie. And you can have a thousand camera angles and the story's bad, it'll make no difference. Yep. You know, well, that does, there is hope because you have things like the film school or, or great schools where they're really trying to teach writers what's important. Well, let's talk about the film school. This is it. I thought writers always worked in very moody, small cottages on the coast of Nantucket or Martha's Vineyard. You know better than that. Yeah, I do, yeah. Because they can never afford those beautiful places. <laughs> yeah. That's the problem. So we were talking a little bit about that on our walk and how hard it is for new writers that maybe aren't known as film writers to break into the business. And mm -hmm. we touched a little bit about on the film school, which uh, you started or helped start. And you want to talk a little bit about that because that's full of young writers or writers hoping to either break into Hollywood or to finance their own films or find somebody to back them. Yeah, it's a break into Hollywood thing that's, uh, I think that's a perception that's got to be lost. But what's bothered a lot of actors and directors over the years is the lack of really good material to inspire the best work. As far as the film school is concerned up here, it's an outcome of having had a conversation with the mayor. The city had a problem financially. The dot-com fallout affected the city's treasury. He was asking if I knew a way to get, to encourage Hollywood to come up here and shoot. They had been coming up here until about 96 or 97, putting 80 to $100 million worth of money into the system here in Washington. All of that's gone, primarily. And uh, I, I, it, when he asked the question, I felt that there was nothing I knew that anyone else didn't know. I mean, it was basically Hollywood was gone. And we shouldn't look to Hollywood to come back here again. Or if we wanted to look down 
the line in the future that they might come back, we had to change our own image. We had to really look at what we had here. One of the most well-read cities. The Seattle Film Festival has created the most sophisticated film-going audience in North America. That's big energy. That's a big deal. That's story. People are very story conscious up here. The film schools are outcropping that. I felt, what could I do to encourage uh, embracing the film community more readily here? Uh, that clearly was dealing, go, go right to storytelling for me. What you have to say, what you have to do creatively, whatever the discipline, has to be first before can I make money at this. Which makes me think, is it courage <clears throat> that artists have the courage to talk about or do the things that nobody else is doing? I know that uh, something I read a long time ago was it said talent is something that is within your control. Genius is something in whose control you are. And you feel somewhat ambivalent about, you know, oh gee, I have to make money, but God, I've got to write this thing first. So you're driven to write something first, which may or may not be recognized in its time as being as terrific a piece as, as, uh, as it is in its own time and place. You read a lot of new filmmakers' works, and often when I've done that, I see that they are either imitating what they've already seen and so it's not really their voice. They're copying the thousands of movies they've seen, the typical love story. Oh, yeah. Right? And then I noticed, you know, at the film school, Stuart Stern teaches that brilliant course, The Personal Connection, where he's really trying to get people to open up about their, what he calls, splat, that tragic event that all of us have that creates this deep wound within us. And it's hard to talk about those things in public, and let alone to write about them. But it also seems to me that when we get through the intellectual part of our brain, the part that's filtering us all the time, how do I behave, how polite should I be, we can get to the place that's willing to tell the truth. Well, telling the truth is, uh, it's complicated. One of the things I think that most artists of any persuasion, one of the things they have to accept is the audacity of the beginner. And it's getting to that moment, it's getting through that splat of being the beginner, of all the reservations that are set up by being a beginner, of all the reservations of being, of recognizing, is this what I really should be, am I wasting my time at this? You never know, I don't know. It just, it is courage, which you said at the beginning. I think it is just being, just, Whatever that is inside you says, I, I just, this is what I got to do. Or naivete. You just have no, yeah. no ability to check <laughs> yourself. Not being afraid of being an ass. I'm working on that. <laughs> well, that seems courageous to me, too. Just, it's scary to try to push your standards up beyond what you think is reasonable. That's scary. No, it's just hard work. That's scary to some people. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> yeah, it seems to be in this day and age. But if you're going to be a filmmaker, learn how to write, learn how to edit, learn how to do, use, learn how to use the camera, learn all of this. Act, direct, and write. If you're going to do any one of these mediums, so that you know what you're dealing with. And you can overcome your own ego by having the strength of having some variety of knowledge from experience, the experience of doing these other things. What's holding me up here? What am I afraid of? Why can't I take a chance? I remember a dentist that I knew years ago when I started making a living as an actor. He said, oh God, I would love to be an actor. I'm so envious of you. And I thought, he's making a good living as a dentist. Why did he not take that chance? That's where the courage comes in. If you want to do that, why are you going to dentist school? If you want to be a dentist, great. If you want to be a, a, a general practitioner of medicine, great. It's a noble, wonderful thing to do. But if you're doing that, 
really wanting to be an, a painter or an artist. Why are you not taking that? Why don't you have the courage to do that? You got the courage to become a doctor for crying out loud. It's worth the risk. We're here and we're gone. Follow your heart. Follow your bliss. Go behind the scenes of the Artist Toolbox as we interview some of the greatest artists in the world today for a special look at the production process, guest bios, and information on future episodes, visit theartisttoolbox.com. To order a DVD of this episode for $19.95 plus shipping and handling, please call 1-800-937-5387 or visit channel9store.com.